I'm cautiously optimistic that there will be enough enough features of the model that are generic that we may be able to make phenomenological predictions sooner rather than later. There are people, those same people who are concerned about the connection between Wolfram physics and reality, they, they often ask, okay, so what are the verifiable predictions you get from this theory? In my mind, it's going to be hard to get there because, first of all, the theories we have, general relativity and quantum mechanics, are extremely precise. They, they work amazingly in terms of predicting what we see in the universe. And because of this problem where the hypergraph is at such a small scale and so much smaller than the Planck scale potentially, or at least, like you say, at an upper bound, it's at the Planck scale, but it could be much, much smaller than that. So we're never going to see nodes and edges directly. We and our instruments are made of nodes and edges, and so it's sort of very difficult to imagine how we could possibly see nodes and edges directly. But I have heard you talk about certain possibilities, uh, things like, you know, uh, small discrepancies in the dimensionality of space from perfectly three-dimensional is one of them that might give us verifiable predictions. What are your thoughts on how we might find evidence for Wolfram physics? Yeah, a few comments that are worth making on that. So one is, I think, what philosophers call a category error. And this is actually something which I, I slightly... It was a disagreement that I had in, in, in sort of how the project was marketed, so to speak, right? This, this, this description of it as like a project to find the fundamental theory of physics, or even worse, yeah. sometimes described as a fundamental theory of physics. <laughs> yes. Where really what it is, is is a formalism, right? Yeah. The Wolfram model is not a theory. It's a formalism that parameterizes an infinite class of theories. And those theories have some commonality. One of the interesting features of it is that certain things that we might think of as being peculiar features of our physical universe, like relativity and quantum mechanics, turn out to be fairly generic features of a large class of those models. But still, asking for verifiable predictions of the Wolfram model as a whole is kind of like asking for verifiable predictions of like calculus or differential geometry. <laughs> yes, it's, you know, it's a language for formalizing theories. It's not, a, it's not a theory in its own right. Yeah. That's the first comment I'd make. But then, okay, so now that that disclaimer is out of the way, yeah, okay, you might hope that there's enough genericity in things like the Einstein equations and whatever emerging in these models that you may be able to make, even at the level of the formalism, you might be able to make quite generic statements about testable predictions. There I have some, I don't know, I, I, I think, okay, it's a fairly generic feature of these Wolfram model systems that they do not have perfectly homogeneous dimension, either in space or in time. Yeah. One fairly generic feature that the models also have is that many of them start off very densely connected and effectively kind of cool down. They become more sparsely connected over time. And that effectively translates to they start off essentially infinite dimensional and then they gradually converge to something that's three dimensional. And that's immediately quite interesting because what that's telling you is that effectively the universe is starting off much more causally connected than you would expect it to be if you assumed it was three-dimensional. And the reason why that's significant is because that potentially offers, for instance, an, an alternative to what's called inflation in standard cosmology, right? So in Big Bang cosmology and what's called Lambda CDM cosmology, there are these major problems, the horizon problem, the flatness problem, the magnetic monopole problem, etc. that can really all be boiled down to the fact that our universe appears to be, appears to have been in causal contact much sooner than it should have been, so to speak, right? So when we okay. look at the cosmic microwave background, the reason why inflation was originally proposed was because when you look at the CMB, you see that it's a very, very homogeneous distribution of radiation, right? The temperature is very homogeneous in space. There are small fluctuations here and there, which is very important because we believe those are the seeds of galaxies yeah. and all large-scale structure. But by and large, you know, within like a couple of percent, it's all about whatever it is, 2.7 Kelvin, kind of everywhere. Yeah. Why is that, right? If, if you just take the standard hot Big Bang model, the standard Lambda CDM model, there wasn't time. If you look at the kind of past light cones of every point in space, there wasn't time for those points to have entered thermal equilibrium. They weren't in causal contact for long enough. So in the standard model of cosmology, they should not be in thermal equilibrium, and yet they are. Yeah. And yeah. so the solution that was proposed by Alan Guth and Andre Linde and so on was that you've got this inflationary period of expansion where the universe expanded much, much more rapidly than we initially thought. That has the effect of essentially smoothing out the initial inhomogeneities that we expect to see as a consequence of quantum fluctuations, so that you're actually so that there is a gradient, but you're seeing a much much shallower gradient than you would have expected in the standard Big Bang model because it's been inflated. Yeah. So this is an approach that's been proposed. It does, you know, the the advantage of inflation is it does explain the horizon flatness monopole problems, etc. But the disadvantage is 
that we have no idea what the particle physics of inflation is, really. Yeah. It relies on this hypothetical inflaton scalar field whose particle physics is essentially unknown. There are these quintessent scalar field models that have been proposed that couple to things like the Higgs mechanism or to dark energy in some slightly complicated way. They're probably the most plausible particle physics mechanisms that are currently being explored, but still, it's basically a mystery. So it's, it's a bit of a non-explanation. It solves one problem, but it you know, brings up a million more. Yeah. The exciting thing about this kind of dimension cooling possibility is that it, it potentially gives one a way to explain away the horizon and flatness problems without the need to postulate inflation, right? Because essentially, if the universe starts off essentially infinite dimensional, then points in space can be in causal contact much, much sooner. The apparent conflict with the horizon problem emerges from the potentially sort of mistaken assumption that the universe has always been three-dimensional. If you relax that assumption and you say maybe earlier on, closer towards the initial singularity, it was much higher dimensional, then points of space can enter causal contact much, much more quickly. They can enter thermal equilibrium much more quickly, and you can reproduce the observations that you see in the CMB without the need to postulate an inflaton, without the need really to postulate any new physics, just this kind of gradual cooling of the dimension. So if that's really true, which we don't know, but it, yeah. it's a fun thing to think about, if that's really true, then one would expect that although you would see almost perfect accord with the predictions of inflation, because the conformal structure of the space-time you get is pretty much identical to that of inflation, there would be some small discrepancies. So in things like yeah. the cosmic neutrino background, or in details of the decoupling time of the cosmic microwave background, we haven't done the work of actually doing all of the kind of theoretical cosmology yet, but it's become pretty clear just from the initial kind of back-of-the-envelope calculations that you can do, that, for instance, you would expect the recombination time and the decoupling times to be sooner, to be earlier, in a model which is based on global dimension change than you would in a model that's based on inflation. And that has consequences for things like, you know, the temperature of dark energy and, and, and things like that. Yeah. So that's one possibility, these kind of cosmological consequences yeah. of global dimension change. Another possibility is essentially astrophysical consequences of local dimension change. So yeah. in addition to the dimension changing globally, you could also imagine having kind of small, local small-scale dimension perturbations that propagate a bit like gravitational waves. And again, they, they, those seem to be very generic features of the model, that it's not, it's almost never the case that you get a Wolfram model rule where the hypergraph is exactly three-dimensional everywhere. There are normally yeah. at least little pockets where it's like 3.01 dimensional somewhere and 2.99 dimensional somewhere else. And those yeah. little perturbations will kind of propagate like nonlinear gravitational waves. And those will ha in turn have kind of lensing effects, just like gravitational waves do. But their lensing effects will be different to gravitational waves because Precisely because of the, the thing I was saying earlier about the exponential versus quadratic contribution to the, to, to the volume. So effectively, if you have a, a, a dimension perturbation, you compare that to a curvature perturbation, the dimension perturbation will distort your light rays much more extremely than a curvature perturbation. Because effectively, one is contributing exponentially, the other is contributing only quadratically to the distortion of the metric. So okay, yeah. this means that you do have a bit of trouble, in principle, distinguishing a very large curvature perturbation from a comparatively small dimension perturbation but at least in principle there are ways that you could try and you know you see some perturbation in the structure of space-time and there are at least heuristic ways that you could try and work out is this a curvature perturbation or is it a dimension perturbation yeah again there's more i can say about that but that's another possibility yes another thing is there are extreme astrophysical events which in principle might kind of lay bare the discrete structure of the space-time so one example of this is in black hole and spirals. This is obviously a very trendy topic in astronomy right now because of LIGO and, and gravitational wave observatories and things. But so when you've got very, very strong relativistic field dynamics, then in effect, because you've got very, very high curvatures, as the curvature gets higher and higher, essentially you've got your causal edge density or, or your hypergraph density becomes progressively lower and lower, right? You've, in a sense, it's like you've got causal edges that are getting more and more stretched across space. Until eventually, you know, very, very close to, say, a black hole merge, when you've got kind of the, the, the maximally strong relativistic field dynamics, you actually expect there to be very, very low causal edge density, perhaps so low that discretization effects become significant. And one possibility there is that you'd... So, and this relates to some, some work I did last year on doing numerical simulations of things like black hole and spirals in the context of the Wolfram model. One thing you quickly discover is if you try and do... If you extract the so-called vial curvature to extract out essentially the quadrupole moment that you get from the gravitational wave perturbation, then depending on the precise mass scales of the black holes, you see some small-scale 
deviations from the expected quadrupole moment that you get from continuum general relativity, and those deviations are essentially discretization effects that occur as a consequence of the causal edge density going way down when you have very strong relativistic field effects. And so another possibility is that as our gravitational wave observatories get more accurate, we may be able to start seeing those small corrections that are really discretization errors in the gravitational wave signatures of violent astrophysical events like black hole in spirals. That's another kind of r rather exciting possibility. Yeah. Then there are kind of more speculative things like, for instance, I've mostly been talking about relativistic, you know, astrophysical, yeah. cosmological predictions. There are also kind of more quantum mechanical ones, like, for instance, one thing that the model predicts that's a little bit different from conventional quantum mechanics is that it implies that there's a maximum speed with which microstates in a quantum system or subsystems of a quantum system can become entangled. So ordinarily in quantum mechanics, there's, no, there's not really any limit to how quickly two different subsystems can become entangled. But because in the Wolfram model, we have a much more geometrical way of visualizing quantum mechanics where the tensor product structure of our Hilbert spaces and therefore the, the entanglement structure is visualized concretely in terms of these branchial graphs. Well, those branchial graphs have a metric and that metric means that there's a maximum speed with which two states can become tensor producted together and therefore can become entangled. That speed is extremely high. You're not going to encounter it in kind of everyday yeah. events. But again, at least in principle, there are laboratory experiments you could do to try and measure maximum entanglement yeah. speeds. So there are known bounds in existing quantum information theory, like the margolis leviton bound, that give you some restrictions on how quickly subsystems or quantum system can become correlated. In effect, the Wolfram model formulation gives us a, 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 a new set of bounds that could also in principle be testable. That's a slightly more speculative idea, but it's at least another possible direction for, for inroads for phenomenological predictions. So yeah, I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic that there will be enough, yeah. enough features of the model that are generic that we may be able to make phenomenological predictions sooner rather than later. But I mean, one, one problem, which is a sociological problem, is that we haven't if we look at the people who've contributed most to the foundational development of the Wolfram model, Stephen is, you know, Stephen was a first-class phenomenological particle physicist yeah. in the 1970s, yeah. but that's it, not really what he does anymore. I'm very yeah. much not, you know, I, I, I have no real training in physics, I'm a mathematician. We have yeah. some people like Xerxes and so on who are theoretical physicists, but again, have kind of really worked more on the mathematical side. You know, so... Part of it is that, you know, part of the reason why we haven't made as much progress with the phenomenological and experimental prediction stuff is just a personnel issue, right? It's that we, yeah. we have, you know, we're, we're pretty well represented for computer scientists and mathematicians yeah. and theoretical, you know, and, and, and more mathematical physicists. We're pretty underrepresented yeah. for phenomenological theoretical physicists. And what we need is someone who's a... It used to be said of Abdus Salam that he was like, he was one of the last people who could, who could really interact with both worlds. Yeah. who understood the mathematics but also understood the experiments and was able to translate between them. And what we need is, the mantra that I have in my head is that what we need is, we need the Abdus Salam of the Wolfram Physics Project. We don't really have that person yet. <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.